Hello and welcome to the Gifted Ed Podcast. We are your hosts, Angel Van Howe, Gifted Coordinator and SEL Facilitator. And Megan McCarthy, Social Worker. We're grateful for the opportunity to share this space with you today as we talk about the complexities of giftedness. We want to introduce our listeners today to Michael Dixon, who is our new Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Michael Dixon, pronouns he, him, joined our school in 2023 as the Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Prior to that, Mr. Dixon served 18 years in higher education at a variety of institutions and administrative positions, most recently as the Chief Inclusion and Diversity Officer at Susquehanna University in Sealands Grove, Pennsylvania. Michael earned his bachelor's degree in philosophy and race from North Carolina State University. He went on to earn his master's degree at the College of Student Affairs Leadership from Grand Valley State University and is a doctoral candidate at the Indiana State University. Welcome to the Gifted Ed podcast, Michael. We're so happy to have you with us today. Wonderful to be here. Thank you. Today, we're going to discuss the role diversity, equity, and inclusion plays within our gifted community. So for starters... How would you define DEI? Diversity, equity, and inclusion sometimes is a misnomer. Uh, The acronym gets put together many times when in actuality, diversity, equity, and inclusion are three separate uh, topics that um, individuals sometimes don't completely understand. Mm -hmm. Diversity really focuses on numbers. Uh, Usually, uh, how many of something that you have uh, sort of the differences mm-hmm. uh, that people might bring uh, to the table, whether they're factors or uh, individual identities. Um, equity focuses on giving people what they need in the amounts that, that they need them, which is really separate from equality, where people get equal amounts of things mm-hmm. or equal amount of stuff. Uh, and then inclusion is really about the structures that are in place to help people feel like they're part of the whole. Um, so how do we create or not create barriers uh, that would enable or not enable uh, things to be feeling like they're included as part of the community. Mm -hmm. With that being said, uh, how do you see DEI's role in a gifted school? Uh, In a gifted school, uh, we'll have individuals who come from various walks of life uh, and uh, more specifically those who have uh, proven themselves to be uh, at least academically and or intellectually Uh, at a level that is different from their peers. And so uh, from a diversity, equity, and inclusion perspective, I think of uh, the individuals who may be at a school that is focused on giftedness uh, to be those who may not come from the same backgrounds, but have all proven that they think at levels that are different from their peers. So we know that we have that in common but we don't necessarily have to have uh, the places that we grew up with, the experiences that we've had previous uh, to this current experience uh, as the same. So DEI is super important in the fact that uh, we're still learning from each other and that individuals who come to a space uh, together have to know that just because we have this in common doesn't mean we have everything else in common. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense to me. I appreciate how you broke down each one specifically. I know I was talking to an administrator, a school administrator who is in a different state, and he was asking questions about DEI. And before we started the conversation, it was helpful to have a like, where are you coming at it lens? And he said, well, I'm coming at it from race. Isn't that where you come from it? And so because that's the world that he is most kind of absorbed in and I was like well I'm coming at it from a mental health standpoint so I think it's also yeah. interesting right I mean you could come at it from, from a neurodiversity uh, standpoint so many right. different mm-hmm. um, socioeconomic class so I think it's interesting to look at those three separate categories and then also what lends your own personal background right what you're bringing to it um, just as a starting point because otherwise I feel like sometimes maybe that's where some disconnects could even happen if you're not realizing the lens that you're even viewing those three parts from. But. Absolutely. And I think a lot of times it's easy to focus on the things that provide numerics. Yeah. So yeah. Race, yeah. race and gender are mm-hmm. the two yeah. best. And I think to a lesser extent, socioeconomic status, because you could put numbers on it. But yeah, uh, I think because it's been such a focal point for the lot of part of the conversation, it's just easy to yeah. default to that. Yeah. Uh, so how does DEI work support community or sense of belonging within a gifted school? So when I think about the work of DEI in 
uh, forming community, I think about the different ways people come together and the fact that you might be from this community or you might be from that community, but we might have shared values. Uh, and we won't know that until we have actually have conversations with mm-hmm. each other about those shared values. But how do you have conversations about shared values? Well, we're going to have to be put in situations or be able to experience things where we can demonstrate those values. And once we are able to demonstrate those values, then have candid conversation about, Mm -hmm. you know, this is important to me and here's why and here's how it plays out in, let's say, my own community or my own household. And, you know, somebody else can either reinforce that or show a a different perspective. I, I think that says a lot about a community when individuals share things about themselves that are just different from each other, what's the response? Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, if it's so different from me, you know, do I immediately shun that or do I, you know, turn away from it or do I, you know, look at it with a sense of curiosity Mm -hmm. uh, to say, oh, I want to learn more about that and therefore, you know, then broaden my worldview and Mm -hmm. and my lens. What What really stuck with me was the experiential component that you mentioned, you know, providing an outlet for those experiences so that people can come to understand each other mm-hmm. and have possibilities for connections, um, I think is really pivotal in that sense. So, Well, and anytime you hit on curiosity and gifted community, those <laughs> generally go together they do. with a lot of questions and a lot. And so I think reinforcing the question versus the assumption part of this is huge, probably within gifted the gifted community and right. students and anyone doing work within DEI. Yeah, and it's it's tough sometimes because when people have questions, they can come off sort of accusatory. Yeah. But, you know, sometimes questions really do come from a sense of curiosity. I just want to learn more about right. that. So, uh, and that's not always easy to sort of navigate. And it really depends on the relationship people might have with one another to say, I'll give the you grace mm-hmm. uh, in terms of, you know, you're asking a question that, you know, in any other, in a different context, might feel like it's intrusive, but right. you know, we have a relationship, mm-hmm. so I think you you're really trying to understand it from your own perspective. Right. No, that makes sense. And do you think there are any common misconceptions that students may have about DEI? And then, if so, what what do you think those could be? Yeah, absolutely. I think that from a developmental standpoint, uh, depend, depending on what's reinforced, you know, outside of the school context, you know, DEI could just be reduced to you know some of the things that we mentioned earlier. Like, oh, it's just a race thing or it's just a gender thing. Um, you know, a lot of the conversation, uh, you know, in the last couple of years has really been like, well, you know, DEI is really a critical race theory thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and without going into too much detail about that, that's saying that sometimes I think that individuals who have uh, very limited scopes in terms of where they grab their information from uh, may not always have the full picture. Um, and so... You know, talking about DEI sometimes from, uh, you know, a kid's perspective is that we got to meet them where they're at, but then we also have to feel like, all right, so yes, this is one part of the conversation. Mm-hmm. Here's yeah. here's another part of the conversation to not negate what's currently being said, but to also then how do we broaden, broaden that out? And I could see that. I'm thinking of previous podcast episode uh, where we talked about the digital world, right, that kids are living in and so much right. of social media it gets one-sided or snippets probably related to DEI. So maybe it's even just bringing those into having a conversation about what they're seeing and experiencing right. on social media. Some might be valid, <laughs> some might not be. But mm-hmm. um, again, I think I like that the idea that the conversation and showing up in that space. And it's difficult because, you know, the students, if they choose not to engage with others who are not like themselves, I mean, that, there's always been talks about sort of the echo chamber of mm-hmm. that. It's just oh, re- right. yeah. reinforcing what they already know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so it's incumbent on, you know, the individuals that are around them to really try to push the, uh, broaden the, at least broaden the spear for them mm-hmm. and say, mm-hmm. you know, questions sort of, all right, so here's one way of presenting. Here's a different way. How does that, you know, reinforce or differ from your current perspective? Um, and then just give them sort of, you don't have to fill in the gaps for them, but just give them an opportunity to reflect on that and maybe ask about it again, mm-hmm. you know, later on to see if any changes in their thinking may have occurred. Well, and I like how you phrase that too, giving them opportunities for their thinking to change that reflection component, because I think sometimes people are afraid of being shamed or being you know, mm-hmm. wrong or judged. 
And I think that provides a more positive space for conversation. I think it's probably hard to be a perfectionist in a DEI yeah. realm, right? So it's challenging yeah. a lot of those yeah. areas that we have to challenge regularly here in a gifted school. I agree. So as far as in the classroom um, with faculty, um, can you think of common misconceptions that you know teachers may have in a classroom related to DEI? Oh, absolutely. Uh, I think that what I think about um, oh, this one famous TEDx talk that I don't know if I can mention that sort of thing. Cut it if you want to. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I remember a famous uh, talk that I've seen you know, on the Internet where it talks about the dangers of a single story where an individual might be said to represent sort of a larger f- identity group that mm-hmm. maybe others may not be asked to represent. Mm-hmm. And so, right. you know, it's my own experience. I can't speak on behalf of individuals that may share my common identity. Right. I can only talk about my experience because I am a combination of many identities and the way that I present myself might be different from somebody who has similar identities, but not the exact same. Right. And right. so in the classroom, I just have, I would like for people to just to understand that you are one person from your specific place that you're from with the family and the experiences that may have helped shape you. And you say something, that's your viewpoint. That's your opinion, not everybody else's opinion. It's not representative of mm-hmm. everybody from that identity. It shouldn't be. Right. But I, I can't, you can't also divorce yourself from the fact that uh, cultures in that, like we're part of the culture, but the culture is not necessarily always interacting with us, if that makes mm-hmm. sense. No, that does. It helps inform who I am mm-hmm, right. as a person, but it's not always shaping how it is that I am presenting myself. Mm-hmm. I love the way you express that. And in terms of families, common misconceptions uh, about DEI, can you share any of those? Well, I think that depending on their interactions, it, I would say at work, in their community, uh, where they live, and sort of their approximation to difference, uh, I think helps inform or not inform um, DEI to to the point where mm-hmm. if I, again, you know, bring it back to echo chamber, if I'm surrounding myself with people who pretty much think similarly, um, who reinforce things that are uh, phrases or ideology that might be similar to my own, uh, I'm not exactly pushing the envelope or thinking more broadly about certain things. Um, and so when I think about maybe topics that might be brought up that could be contrary to what it is that I believe in, I might immediately, you know, shut it down or not support it because, you know, my friends also feel the same way. And there's no reason to talk about it because right, it's right. not something that we share. Right. How does DEI support social emotional well-being and academics? Uh, you know, social, and that that was a new thing for me uh, coming into uh, the K through 12 space. Mm-hmm. So in higher education, mm-hmm. uh, I mean, we would call it sort of the life transitional, like think skills that you just need to be a better person yeah. uh, to transition to life better. Uh, but, you know, in the K through 12 space, you know, understanding that social emotional thing, it's just how do you cope with, um, you know, and this is not everything but you know how do you cope with adversity how do mm-hmm. you uh, regulate you know when things aren't exactly working in the ways that you intend it to be right um, and so when I think about sort of the DEI component of that space it's like uh, I'm talking with somebody and they say something that may not completely uh, uh, align with yeah. what it is that I'm thinking so and I'm feeling you know a, a certain change in my behavior or mm-hmm. I might feel you know I'm getting hot and bothered and uh, you know how do I how do I regulate that? What are things that I might tell myself? What are uh, situa- How do I take myself out of that situation that won't feel as awkward? Or how do I change the subject that might, uh, you know, better align with uh, what it is that we could be doing you mm-hmm. know, differently? Yeah. And I think about all of those things, and you know, those are all different ways. You know, again, of thinking of giving somebody what it is that they need to be successful, and then from an inclusion standpoint, you know, making sure that the environment is situated in a way that will allow for people to come at various parts of the conversation and uh, you know those situations uh, will allow themselves sort of the opportunity for people to just get what they need in order to be successful. 
And I can see how a lot of the conversations that we've had in different episodes about perfectionism, right, or like how we come to a task if we're wrong, how do we sit with being uncomfortable? And I would argue that a lot of times you're not wrong with your opinion in DEI, but that's kind of how it feels. It could feel I could see as a student. And so if I'm wrong, then that's something I have to cope with and sit with and then come at with questions versus trying to change your mind, which sometimes happens in the academic world, right? Of, of And if it's not something like math where there is a clear cut answer, I think, like you said, a lot of those like self-regulatory skills of how to engage in this conversation without that proving I'm right discomfort. Well, and another layer to that I was thinking about is in terms of culture, how different cultures express and understand, you know, emotions. Um, some can be more, you know, mm-hmm. um, demonstrative and, and, and you see, you know, what's on the surface right away. Others are a little bit more subtle. So I think that also is a unique layer. And I think, too, when you said, you know, kind of the higher education, like the next step is obviously what any K through eight building wants to do is also make sure students are solid when they get to their next environment, whatever that might be. And it might not be a gifted school where you're Mm -hmm. around a bunch of gifted students. So even just adjusting to what that might be, those are life skills of just being able to navigate different environments, too. Absolutely. You know, the next the next step, you know, after this is, you know, from what I understand, it's not always kind. And so being able to just understand that piece mm-hmm. uh, for yourself, uh, you know, to your point yeah. that I might be going into an environment, not only is it not a gifted environment, but it's also uh, an environment that may not either recognize, support, or understand who I am. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, and so, I, like you said, I need to have the skills to be able to sort of navigate what that might look like. Yeah. Well, and I think this leads well into the next idea of just how does DEI work with or include neurodiversity? Oh, absolutely. So uh, when I think about neurodiversity, I mean, and I know that it, it's not just this, but even yes, even yesterday, uh, I was, uh, I am a basketball official. Yesterday, I did a special Olympics basketball event. Mm -hmm. Uh, And when I think about sort of my interactions as the official with Mm -hmm. these uh, young uh, men and women who love basketball, uh, but may not always be adhering to the rules uh, in the ways, you know, to to the letter, Mm -hmm. you know, how do you allow for some flexibility with sort of understanding the spirit of the rule? Mm -hmm. Uh, their love for the game of basketball, while also still sort of developing the camaraderie that comes with, you know, playing an organized sport. All those parts Mm -hmm. form a relationship with each other. Yeah, Yeah. absolutely. And so I think that I might be in a better position, because even after the game, when I talked with the coaching staff and the parents, you know, they talked about Mm -hmm. sort of, you know, you did really well with our, our kids. And mm-hmm. I'm like, you know, I think that just lends itself that neurodiversity, it does, it's not ha- necessarily hampering. It's just mm-hmm. a different way of thinking. Mm-hmm. Right. And I think from a DEI perspective, if, <laughs> if you get past the dichotomy of right and wrong, it's, yeah. just, you know, it's just a different way of thinking. So then how do you adjust your way of thinking mm-hmm. to sort of fit in with right. how it is they might be understanding and, and sort of rearrange the explanations to sort of fit in with how they might interpret it. Mm-hmm. I know we touched on this a little bit. Um, our students attend an entirely gifted school and learn with peers who have similar cognitive profiles. But what about when they leave this school, right? And they venture out into non-gifted centered institutions, being that a minority of the population is gifted and they tend to experience vulnerabilities such as asynchronous development, emotional intensities, perfectionism, and poss- possibly alienation. How do we prepare our students for this transition? It's It's not always that we can prepare them fully correct because uh, <laughs> even in the best best of intentions right. uh, we may not be able to you know prepare them fully because we may not have seen it or it might show up differently based on you know when we were in the same or similar yeah. space right absolutely 2023 is much different than 2015 which mm-hmm. may be different than you know early 2000s etc cetera, etc cetera, you know infinite regress uh, but the point of the matter is that we can do our best to sort of mimic uh, you know real life situations. Uh, that they might experience, you know, say you were in a, uh, you know, situation and, you know, X happened, you know, how would you respond to that? So role playing and... It's role playing, but right. it's it's different from an intellectual exercise mm-hmm. of role playing, mm-hmm. but actually putting people in situations and then 
you know, getting the component of actually doing the reflective piece, uh, either both in person or, you know, a written reflection to sort of talk about, uh, you know, if you were in that situation, you know, how would you respond? Because sometimes when we talk about, and this is sort of a tangent, but, you know, from a bystander right. uh, training perspective, you know, a lot of times people will say, well, if I was in that situation, I would do mm-hmm. such and such. Mm-hmm. And then they get in that situation and, and they it don't. doesn't. Yeah. <laughs> They're just stuck. Yeah. <laughs> but it takes time for people to sort of reflect on that. Like, what would I do in that situation? Because uh, maybe I did not act because I was unfamiliar with, mm-hmm. you know, how I would feel or what I was experiencing. You didn't know what you didn't know. Yeah. <laughs> what I was experiencing in that moment. And now, you know, I've had an opportunity to talk with somebody it's sort of about how I'm feeling. So if I do mm-hmm. get in that situation, maybe. I would be more apt to act in this way. I may not, right. but I at least talked mm-hmm. about it and I at least experienced it. Well, thank you, Michael, for joining us. Um, I think it kind of just speaks to the importance of conversation and just having dialogue about and curiosity and, curiosity mm-hmm. and leading with questions. So and experiences. We appreciate you taking all of our questions. <laughs> thank you for this time. So we wanted to end uh, with some reflection piece, and we wanted you all to think about your initial preconceptions of DEI. And how do they compare to your understanding now? So another thing that we wanted to put out there was a call to action. Based on our conversation today, what is one way you can support DEI within your classroom? We want to thank you for joining us in the space today. Please subscribe to the Gifted Ed podcast to stay up to date with our latest episodes. Stay tuned for our next episode that continues to unpack the complexities of giftedness.